Good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Strauss. I'm the co-chair of the Town of Olives Conservation Advisory Council. In my day job, I help renewable energy developers get financing for their projects. Tonight, my colleague Jasmine Graham and I are here to talk to you about community choice aggregation. Um, Jasmine and I are both on the board of the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition. Uh, I'm going to speak to you primarily from the perspective of someone who's on a conservation advisory council and interested in community choice aggregation for their municipality. Uh, and then I'm going to turn most of the presentation over to Jasmine, uh, who's going to talk you through exactly what a CCA is, the background of CCAs, uh, and why it's of relevance to uh, CACs, uh, environmental commissions, and uh, conservation boards everywhere. Um, I will come back after about five slides and talk a little bit about our local area and the CCA administrators, like the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition, who are available to municipalities in our area. So you've got a sense for, from your Conservation Advisory Council's perspective, what your choices are. Uh, Jasmine will talk about uh, CCAs in general and what the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition is doing. So Jasmine, let me turn it over to you to introduce yourself and uh, talk about the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition and CCAs. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine Graham. As was mentioned, I'm the executive director at Mid-Hudson Energy Transition, and we are a 501c3 not-for-profit headquartered in Kingston, right on Wall Street in Uptown. And our mission is to empower municipalities, their residents and businesses to own and share renewable energy, create healthier buildings and join in community wealth building to strengthen the resilience of the Hudson Valley in the face of climate change. And we are a CCA administrator, but I would say that we are a specialized CCA administrator. And our goal is really to lead a more equitable and democratic model of CCA. And we'll definitely get into how we do that a little bit later on. But I'll start with the absolute you know, beginnings of what is community choice aggregation or CCA. Um, so with a community choice aggregation program, the community is able to make energy choices, right, by aggregating eligible customers into a buying pool. I often speak about it like Costco. When you buy in bulk, you often get a better deal. Um, and New York State law allows a municipality to decide where their energy comes from, not the local utility. So oftentimes people think that their utility is the deciding factor and where their energy comes from, but the utility is actually the supplier of last default, meaning they have to supply you if you don't choose to get your energy from anywhere else, um, but they're not actually the starting point. And so with a CCA program, every resident and small business does have the opportunity to opt out of the CCA without penalty. And a little bit later, we'll get into kind of the mechanics of how a CCA program works. But let's just start off with a brief history of CCA. So the first community choice aggregation uh, started in Massachusetts in 1997. So at this point, it's pretty well established. The first CCA in New York State was at Sustainable Westchester in 2016. That's actually my former employer. So I managed that CCA program for four years, uh, grew it from 20 to 27 municipalities and kind of, uh, you know, set the stage for what was to come in CCAs. We were the pilot program in New York State at the time, and now it's expanded greatly. Um, and CCAs are only able to exist in states with deregulated energy markets. So you can see here, uh, the green and the blue states are the ones that either have CCAs or are actively investigating them. And I'll switch it back to Simon to talk to you about what the CCA landscape looks like here locally. So if you look at the uh, Mid-Hudson in the uh, graphic that's up on the screen, uh, you can see that there are quite a lot of CCA uh, that have been passed. And, and uh, a little later, Jasmine will talk about some of the requirements to get a CCA in your municipality. But a quite a lot of municipalities have already passed the local law, and uh, many of them are actually already in CCAs. 
uh, from a choice in Ulster County. Um, there are two for-profit CCA administrators, Jewel, J-O-U-L-E assets, and its CCA, which is called Hudson, Hudson Valley Community Power. And um, the first one, two, three, and Saugerties uh, in Ulster County are in that CCA. Olive has passed its local law, but is not elected yet to join a CCA. And Kingston has uh, retained the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition to be its CCA administrator. And then in Dutchess County, I think all the ones that are on the list there um, have also joined the Hudson Valley Community Power CCA, as have the three in Putnam County. So there is a, a third administrator called Good Energy. Uh, I don't believe they've got anyone in Ulster County, but I know they have some municipalities in Green County. So if any of you from your CAC perspective are looking at joining a CCA, you probably want to at least invite those two for-profits and us, the not-for-profit CCA, to come in and talk to your town about what's involved in a CCA. Jasmine will uh, compare and contrast how the Mid-Hudson Energy Transition runs its CCA uh, in a little bit. So that's just putting it, the local landscape in terms of uh, you who are running CACs or interested in CCA for your municipality, what your choices are. Jasmine, back to you. Thanks so much, Simon. All right, so now we'll get into a little bit of the mechanics on how community choice aggregation programs work. At its most simple, the CCA buys cleaner energy. Um, in general, uh, because this is a bulk purchase, you are getting competitive rates. Um, oftentimes you can have savings, but they're not guaranteed because it is a fixed rate while the utilities rate uh, goes up and down, it's variable. Your utility continues to deliver your energy, maintains the lines and sends you your bills. And then you, the end use consumer, you benefit from renewables and choice and local control. And to break it down in a little bit more detail, um, CCAs typically are purchasing renewable electricity. Um, they're not mandated to choose a renewable supply. So some CCAs have a standard supply that is non-renewable um, and you always have the option to switch between. Um, there is one gas CCA in New York State uh, down in Long Island. Um, Personally, I don't think that's a the route that Mid-Hudson Energy Transition will be going anytime soon. We're hoping to get people off of gas, um, but most of the CCAs that you see are purchasing renewable electricity, and that's just for your electricity supply. So on your bill, you know, you might see you have your supply charges and your delivery charges. Um, those two are always going to be on your bill. And no matter what, your utility is going to be the one that delivers your electricity. They own the wires, the pole, the grid infrastructure. And so that never changes. Um, and because of that, the quality, the reliability of your electricity always remains the same. They're mandated to give everyone the same level of service. In terms of enrollment, one of the unique factors about CCAs is that they are structured as opt-out programs meaning that all eligible participants in your municipality will be automatically enrolled in the program after a uh, notification letter is sent out to all of the eligible participants uh, and after a 30-day opt-out period, right? So everyone gets a letter in the mail that says, hey, your town is signed up with a community choice aggregation. Here's the, your electricity supply. Here's how much it, uh, your rate will be. And if you don't opt out in the next 30 days, you're going to be enrolled in the program. Um, but folks can opt out at any point. Um, the, the reason why CCAs are structured as opt-out programs is because of that bulk purchasing effect, where you are able to say, hey, listen, we've got 10,000 households or 20,000 households. Or when I was at Sustainable Westchester, it was 115,000 households. So you're able to say, what's the best rate that we can get? And you typically do get a better rate than you would as a consumer on your own. But anyone can opt out at any time without penalty. There's no fees, there's no late fees, there's no charges. You can leave. We uh, had a question when we were presenting over at the village of Rhinebeck a few weeks ago. Um, and someone said, can you opt out and then opt back in and opt out and opt back in? And that's an option too. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility and there's no penalties for any of that. 
In terms of your billing, you still get your monthly bill from the utility. Um, as always, you're going to have your supply charge and your delivery charge. And the only thing that you're really going to see changing on your bill is that the line item for supply will now be provided by the CCA and you'll have our fixed rate. Um, in terms of customer service, the utility is the one that continues to handle any billing issues, any power outages or service disruptions uh, for all participants, regardless of whether or not they're in a CCA program. So nothing changes on that front. And so when I said in when you, I pulled up that uh, photo of uh, how a CCA system works, I said, typically, this is how it works, right? Uh, because at its most simple, CCA 1.0, we call it, um, that's the just limited to the bulk purchase of power, of renewable electricity, right? So that's that bulk purchasing that I was just talking about. Out in California, they have what's called CCA 2.0, and that actually adds in the ability to build local renewable energy supply. So that's something that's not happening here in New York, but it's a, a model out in California but what we're doing here is advanced CCA or CCA 3.0. And for us, we know that you know, the emissions and the impact doesn't actually stop at electricity. There's emissions in all sectors, and I'll get into that on the next slide. Um, but we take a more holistic approach where we're folding in community solar, building electrification, um, distributed energy resources, which are things like uh, solar and battery storage on your roof, um, as well as wealth building opportunities to community members. And I'm really excited to get into um, how that works for us. So in a traditional CCA or that CCA 1.0 that I spoke about, you've got some really solid benefits. First and foremost, you have price stability. So when I started working at a CCA, I was blown away by the fact that people just get their energy bill and you don't know what you're gonna pay until you get it. And that you have a variable rate that changes every month. And it actually changes depending on your meter read cycle and the day that your meter is read. So the CCA does lock in a fixed price for renewable energy supply. You always know what you're going to pay on your supply month to month. And so you have a level of price stability and protection against the fluctuations in the energy market. Um, in addition, you're supporting renewable energy. So we purchase renewable energy certificates or RECs um, that offset all of the uh, electrons or all of the green energy that is used. Uh, you also have greater community control. So as mentioned before, your utility is the supplier of last default, meaning they have to supply you if you don't do anything else. But that also means that they're just purchasing, you know, standard dirty energy, fossil fuel, fired energy. And so by joining a CCA, your community is able to choose a new electricity supply and have greater control over what um, what type of product you want, whether it's 100% green or 50% green. Um, and I've always uh, shot for 100% green. And then one of the other benefits is municipal funding. So joining a CCA with a renewable supply is actually one of the highest point items on New York State's climate smart communities and clean energy communities challenges, uh, which positions municipalities to receive increased state funding. So those are the traditional CCA benefits, right? If you're doing CCA 1.0, you're getting all of these benefits. But when you look at the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in New York State, you'll see that electricity is only 13% of our statewide emissions. And so if we want to make the impact that we need to make in order to meet our climate goals, we need to be addressing all of these other sectors and buildings is the greatest, uh, followed by transportation. And so our CCA 3.0, our advanced model, looks to bundle buildings, transportation and electricity in order to have a greater impact. And so the benefits of our advanced model is that it goes beyond price stability. It goes beyond just plain renewable energy and you still get the community control and that municipal funding, but we also provide wraparound services for further clean energy developments, equitable financing, which is a really big piece for us, and community and household level resilience. So it's 
not just a financial mechanism to purchase renewable energy certificates, but really it's holistic support for individual households to make their clean energy transition on an individual and community level. And I'll get into how we do that. So first and foremost, one of the things that's really important to us at Mid-Hudson Energy Transition is healthy and resilient homes. You saw the buildings account for 32% of statewide emissions, and we're designing programs that take people through the decarbonization process in a really simple way um, where we can make sure that they have consultation, uh, building assessment with comprehensive audits that go beyond the standard energy efficiency audit, connecting them to funding options, be it state, federal um, uh, incentives or tax credits, um, and our own funding options, which I'll talk about in a moment, along with efficiency upgrades and then following up. So ultimately, we hope to be a one-stop shop for folks that are looking to decarbonize their homes and have healthy and resilient places to live. And the caption here under this photo is one of the most important pieces, right? The cheapest energy is the energy you don't use in the first place. And so energy efficiency is a really critical piece for us. Um, folks who are maybe energy nerds to the level that I am might have seen some new reports that came out from the New York State Independent System Operator or NISO. Um, that's the entity that oversees our electricity grid and makes sure that we have um, stability and reliability on a on a statewide level. Um, and the what it says is is that we really need energy efficiency um, because right now when we're trying to transition all of our energy over to renewables that's a really heavy lift and so if we can first reduce our energy load by making everything energy efficient we have a lot less work to do in terms of the amount of renewables that we need to get on the grid in a short period of time so we've got our healthy and resilient homes program we also are looking to finance an equitable clean energy transition. There are a lot of state incentives through New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, and you all might be aware of the Inflation Reduction Act and the many incentives that are coming down through that. But there's still a gap, especially for the most low-income folks. And so we're creating the Mid-Hudson Energy Equity Fund. Our goal is to provide grants and very low interest loans to Mid-Hudson residents to create healthy and resilient homes and to bolster a local renewable energy economy. And for us, it's about ensuring that all residents, regardless of income, regardless of credit score, um, you know, regardless of any factors, can afford a home that keeps them safe and comfortable and healthy. And so we're currently writing the offering memorandum um, and our finance guru, Simon, can definitely uh, chat about it more with you all um, if this is a piece that you're really interested in because it is one of the key um, elements of how we are making sure that we're offering holistic services. But the thing that really sets us apart more than anything else, you would think it would be our innovative financing or our healthy and resilient homes program, but how we really differ from other CCAs is our community engagement. For us, it's really the key to success for our model of CCA, where we are layering in all these voluntary programs. So on top of the opt-out renewable electricity supply, you have these other programs that are going to provide a real benefit to the community, but that also means that you need to get out into the community. Um, and so what we've started in Kingston with our, um, our first CCA is a community council that we're getting off the ground right now that actually guides the programming of the CCA. So we're able to engage low-income folks, renters, um, communities of color in a community council that has a say in how we develop our programs to make sure that we are designing programs that are um, actually responsive to community needs. And so one of the first things that we did when we became the administrator for Kingston is we went on a listening tour um, and we started meeting community groups and, you know, learning what does the community care about, what do they prioritize, and how can we deliver programs that they are asking for rather than us saying, 
hey, here's a program that we think you need. So our community engagement is really key and the probably most important factor in our success. And then our relationship to the municipality. For us, we really focus on providing turnkey services um, and they're at no cost to the municipality. And the way that we are um, able to have this robust CCA 3.0 mission and vision is that we seek philanthropic grants and state and federal and local government funding to support our advanced initiatives. As I mentioned before, we prioritize real collaboration and we can structure our engagement depending on the unique community needs. We've built in that flexibility and it's important to how we function. Um, and then, as I said before, we position uh, communities and municipalities to receive extra funding through the Climate Smart Communities and Clean Energy Communities grants. So our flagship program is Kingston Community Energy, um, and that is how we've kind of branded Kingston CCA. Um, as I mentioned before, we're developing a community council and across the board, we are inviting all community members to help design and carry out the strategy and the implementation of our programs. Um, we've talked about how we could have a participatory planning process in which we learn from the community, what does a renewable energy transition look like to you locally? Um, and for us, it's all about local knowledge, control, and ownership, right? For us, by taking our energy future into our own hands, we're able to ensure resilience, stability, and affordability in this accelerating climate crisis. And for us, we know that the community already has the local knowledge needed to make these programs work. We come in, we're technical experts, and we're able to assist, um, but we're not here for top-down solutions. We're really here to support um, the grassroots and make sure that everyone has a voice in their energy system. I think that's how community choice aggregation was initially envisioned, but it's not always how it is realized. And so for us, we're really able to um, work out and, uh, and prioritize how you know CCA was kind of intended to be, which is a strategy for energy and economic democracy. And so this is just a sample timeline of what it looks like um, to join a CCA. So first and foremost, you have to pass a local law. Um, each municipality would pass this CCA enabling legislation, and it is just that. It is a piece of enabling legislation. So it is non-binding. It doesn't say that we are 100% pursuing CCA. As Simon says, um, <laughs> Simon says, I've never actually used that in a say. <laughs> um, but as Simon said, um, the town of Olive has their local law on the books, but they haven't um, actually signed up with any administrator. So you go through the process of uh, getting that enabling legislation on the books that requires a public hearing. And then you go into the outreach and PSC authorization phase. Um, so that can take anywhere between two and five months. Um, we petitioned with the Public Service Commission back in February um, and our 60 day comment period for our administrator approval um, was on the docket back in April. And so we are in that kind of waiting game, but you do at least uh, 60 days of outreach. That's what's mandated by the Public Service Commission. But as you can expect, based on how we plan to run our CCA, we tend to go above and beyond that. We've been doing outreach in Kingston for much longer and will continue to do so. Then you go through sourcing. And so that is a competitive bid process where you go out to energy suppliers and you're able to say, hey, We've got these three towns that want to join a CCA. We've got, you know, maybe 25,000 households. What's the best rate that we can get? And in the past, um, one of the things that I actually instituted, um, the CCA that I formerly ran, was um, a reverse bidding software. And you could actually see the energy suppliers bidding against each other in real time. And if anybody outbid the other suppliers in the last like two minutes, 
the auction got kicked out another two minutes. And so what was initially scheduled to be a 15 minute auction became 47 minutes with the, those suppliers continuously underbidding each other. Um, and so it's a it's kind of an exciting day <laughs> when you go out for bid. Um, and one of the key pieces is a not to exceed price. So when you are putting out your request for proposals or your RFP, you set a cap of the maximum price that you would like to pay. And if suppliers don't come in under that, you don't have to move forward on the contract. Um, and so there's ways to put in certain price protections and make sure that you're not getting some exorbitant rate that you're not comfortable with. Um, and then you go into the launch phase. And so that's when we send out those letters to every household and we continue to do our outreach. We let people know who the winning bidder was, who the supplier is, et cetera. And then post-launch for us is really all about continued outreach and then connecting people with our other programs. So while other CCAs might uh, kind of stop at post-launch, you know, you're signed up, you're in our um, electricity supply program, and now you just sit back and you get your bill and you're purchasing renewable electricity. That's a great first step. But for us, once you go into that post-launch phase, that's where we can say, hey, you've got renewable electricity, but you can sign up for community solar and get a 10 or a 15% discount in addition to your CCA supply. Or we can say, I heard you say that, you know, your bill is high. We'd love to come out for an energy audit and see why that is and connect you with financing to upgrade your insulation, right? And so we kind of take um, a more hands-on or even kind of hand-holding approach for folks to make sure that they have um, all of the resources they need to be sustainable beyond just electricity supply. So thank you. I know I threw a lot your way and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. And here's my contact information. So please feel free to reach out. Um, I am going on vacation next week. So if you don't hear from me right away, that's why. Um, but please do reach out and I'll start taking some questions. Uh, I have a question, Jasmine. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between joining a CCA and an individual joining a energy service company, an ESCO, on their own? Uh, you know, the, 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 the differences, uh, the benefits or, or, or drawbacks of that. Absolutely. So any individual, because New York State has a deregulated energy market, any individual can go out and choose their own electricity supplier. So oftentimes that means you're calling up an ESCO, you might have gone on New York State's Power to Choose website, you find an ESCO that has, you know, a favorable rate, you give them a call and you say, hey, like, I see that you're offering this rate, I want to sign up, you give them your account number, they sign you up. One of the main concerns with ESCOs as they currently stand is that they offer really low introductory rates. And so folks will say, oh, I got this great deal with XYZ company. Um, but then after your six month period or one month or however long, you go on month to month billing. And then your electricity rate goes back to variable. And typically it goes up over time because you're not paying attention and they know that. Um, we know that that is actually why they offer you a low introductory rate, because they know that you're not really going to pay attention at the six month mark and remember to choose another electricity supplier. Oftentimes, there's also termination fees. So one of the things that I like to mention to folks is even if your town joins up for a CCA, you as an individual, if you're already in a contract with an ESCO, we don't pull you out of that. Um, we couldn't and we wouldn't want to, right? You've made a choice. Uh, but then there's oftentimes people who say, but I would love to be with you. I would love to join your CCA, um, but I'm already signed up with this other supplier. And so what we say is first, make sure that there's not a termination fee because that's one of the biggest ways how they get you is you're locked in now and you can't leave even if you see that the rates in the market are more favorable. So by going through a community choice aggregation, it is a bulk purchase. And <laughs> while 
you know, my comments on it being similar to Costco is definitely an oversimplification. It is economies of scale. And so you are able to say, hey, we have a significant amount of customers. It is in your best interest to win this bid. And therefore they have to compete against other ESCOs for your service in a way that they don't really have to do as an individual. So typically that's how CCAs get more favorable rates, but any individual always has the ability to sign up with an ESCO or an energy supplier on their own. Thank you. Of course. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, thanks. I live in Marbletown and uh, I am part of whatever Marbletown's arrangement is with Next Amp. Mm. Uh, now is, is Next Amp a... Uh, I have heard the expression community solar, but is that one of the community choice uh, methods that you're describing? So um, in Marble Town, their administrator would be Jewel Assets, as Simon mentioned, but because they go out to bid, just as I described, um, Nexamp could very well be their electricity sup uh, supplier. So Nexamp could have been the entity that, um, that won that bid. I I say could be because I'm not sure. Um, they could also be potentially a community solar subscriber, um, but I would have to take a look at your bill and I am happy to uh, do uh, that. Oh, well, it sounds like maybe we're a community solar because uh, the basic deal is that uh, we get a credit on our central Hudson bill for the actual kilowatt hours delivered. And then we get charged that amount by next amp less 10%. Uh, yes. which which I can follow. But my, my real question is, if you, I hope you know the answer, or, or know where I can look, there's, there's the 10%. Nexamp uh, reimburses us. Sorry, we, we pay Nexamp 90%. Right. Uh, right. This, this maybe made sense two years ago when uh, electricity was about six cents a kilowatt hour. Now that it's double that, it means that Nexamp has doubled its revenue with no increase in its fixed uh, in its fixed cost, which is already the, that was the investment in the solar in the solar uh, panel field. Uh, and what I wanted wanted is where did the ten percent come from? Who agreed to it? Is that is did my town have something to do with that? Did the public service commission? I mean, who 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 should be thinking about Nexamp really making out? with its present deal. Yeah, so what you're referring to is definitely community solar, and it's something that we layer in. So um, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk with my hands for a second. So um, on your bill, you've got supply and delivery, as I mentioned, right? No matter what, your utility is gonna do supply. When you bulk purchase electricity through the CCA, you get um, a new supplier, which is an ESCO or an energy supplier, right? They bid against each other, they give you a fixed rate, and hopefully that rate is good. Um, now, on top of that, you can layer on community solar and get a 10% discount. It doesn't have to be 10%. Um, different solar developers, different um, you know, subscriber agreements exist. So for example, in Kingston, we are soon going to launch um, a community solar campaign for our CCA um, that has a 15% discount. Um, that was something that we worked out with the solar developer um, and with our partners, our technical partners, Power Market. Um, and we were really adamant that we felt like if we're gonna be subscribing low-income people, we need an extra benefit. So we said, we'll take a little bit less on our end in order to offer a 15% discount. Um, so anyone can sign up with community solar projects. They don't have to be related to your CCA. So you might've signed up with Nextamp either with, it, it could be in partnership, but it also can be on your own. The 10% discount is what is standard. Um, and the way that it gets paid out and the way that it works, which is a little bit wonky is, a solar project is built somewhere else and you are, you know, basically claiming some portion of, of the project, right? Like they'll say Jim's house, you know, Jim's house is about four solar panels. 
And then depending on how much electricity is generated by those solar panels, you get that bill discount. The way that it works with Nexamp um, is you have a two bill scenario, right? Which is, is not really standard anymore. We're at the point where, um, where single bill exists and you can get it all on your utility bill. Um, but the way that you described it is exactly how it would work for most people that have that two bill scenario. You pay it back at 90%. But I wouldn't say that Nexamp is um, is benefiting anymore because they still have to pay back the that rest of that utility bill, right? So they're getting that ten percent, or they're offering you that ten percent discount based on how much solar is generated by the project, not necessarily by the market rates of your electricity supply. Um, and to get even just like the slightest bit wonkier, the way that it actually works is your utility is able to claim the benefits of those renewable energy projects through renewable energy certificates or those RECs that I mentioned earlier. And that's why we get paid as subscribers because they're able to purchase those RECs and say, hey, we're, you know, we're meeting our clean energy mandates. And then they're paying us to make that claim and say, hey, we're, we're building renewables. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of wonky program, but in the end, it generally is a win, win, win in that the utility is able to meet its, um, you know, mandated clean energy requirements, the customer gets a discount and then the solar developers also get, you know, profitable projects. Okay. Okay. Well, just one more, hopefully, hopefully a short question, but okay. a follow up. Uh, so in my situation, well, Nexamp is on the party on its side of the of the deal for ten percent, but who's on my side? Who agreed to ten percent? Was it my town? Was it as a CCA? Was I mean, who 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 agreed with Nexamp? Ten percent was the right the right number. It depends how you signed up. Um, I believe there. So opt out community solar um, is currently paused at the Public Service Commission. Um, and so there was a few opt-out community solar projects. So it, I'm I'm not entirely sure if Marble Town actually went that route. In that case, it would be your town that signed up for that. Um, but as an individual, um, if at some point you signed up for it, then then that would have been you know from you. But I would say that the ten percent isn't necessarily a bad discount. It actually fifteen percent. What we're going to offer in Kingston is the outlier. Um, and so I would say, you know, it's not, it's not great, you know, it's not, or it's not the best, but it's still good. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say without, um, you know, knowing just more of the backstory who signed up. Jasmine, that. let me just jump in for a minute. At the town of Olive, we ran a, a community solar program and it was with Ulster County and it was called Solarize Ulster. And they're the ones who set that 10%. And so any of the towns involved with the solarized Ulster got that 10%. Got it. Yeah, and that that is standard. Um, that is uh, typically what people offer all across the state. Um, as I said, our 15% is certainly an outlier and we just kind of fought pretty hard for that. Um, I also have next stamp and I live in Marble Town. I, I think the question is, we, we also now have opt out um, the CCA um, and we're all on it. So the question is, I, I think what Jim and, and I are trying to figure out is, does it still make sense to, to subscribe to Nextam? So basically we have two services. I would say yes, um, because while, um, while the CCA is not guaranteed savings, community solar is. So, you know, it it really it really is a benefit. It's pretty much the only guaranteed savings program out there. Um, you really can't find anything else like it. And one of the benefits of most CCA agreements, and again, without looking at yours, I can't say for sure, but typically um, you have that 10% discount for something like 20 years. Um, in our 15% project that we've got going in Kingston, I believe it's actually 25 years. So there's not a lot of places or not, not a lot of mechanisms for you to get a guaranteed discount on your electricity bill for decades. So I would say definitely stay in it. Um, and, 
you know, paired with the fixed rate from the supply contract, you you should make out pretty well. But of course, you know, past performance doesn't equal future performance and no guarantees, et cetera. And I have a question. Uh, okay, I live in the town of Rochester. Okay. And Rochester um, has, a, they allowed um, solar farms to be built. Oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. I can't remember now. And Nexamp took them over and they offered us a deal, you know, so we signed up. So suppose the town of Rochester decides to um, sign up with community solar with the uh, with uh, community choice aggregation, like your outfit, say. How does that affect us? Do we say, oh, forget next amp, you know, we don't need you anymore, or it's really confusing? Yeah, so you can be in both, and I would always recommend it. I, I would never tell anybody to get out of their community solar subscription. It's a great deal. It's a guaranteed discount. You can't get that anywhere else. So if if the town of Rochester signed up with a new CCA provider, the only thing that might change, right, is the the line item on your bill under electricity supply. So, you know, typically you'll have the, the name of, of the energy supplier that won the competitive bidding process. So there's, there's many out there. Um, let's call it Jasmine Energy as just an example. So if you're signed up with Jasmine Energy um, through the town of Rochester, you're going to see on your bill Jasmine Energy nine cents per kilowatt hour or whatever it is that you might be paying. And then, and so that's a fixed rate. So month to month, no matter what, you're gonna get nine cents per kilowatt hour from Jasmine Energy. The only reason why your bill will go up and down at that point is because of potentially fluctuations in the delivery rate that the utility uh, provides. Because remember, as I said, no matter what, your utility is gonna deliver your energy, but you can choose where your supply is. So you're getting your supply from Jasmine Energy. It's a fixed rate, but your delivery is still coming from your local utility. Now, any changes to your bill at that point is from a fluctuation in the delivery charge or just using more or less energy, right? In the summer, we use a lot of electricity. So you might use 1,000 kilowatt hours instead of 800. So you're still paying the same price per kilowatt hour, but you used more electricity and so your bill went up. Um, but it is a fixed rate. Let me let me yeah. ask the question a different way, okay? Um, because I'm still totally confused. Sorry. Uh, suppose the the town signs up with community choice aggregation, and I'm on Nextamp, and I already get a bill from Nextamp and a bill from Central Hudson. How's it now? What happens with the community choice aggregation? It would all be on your Central Hudson bill. Um, so as I said before, with Nextamp, it's it's unique because you're paying them back at that 90%, um, but everything would still be on your central Hudson bill. It would just be literally a line item that you see that says, you know, you're paying this amount for the supply. If your current situation is that you're paying it back to Nextamp, that wouldn't change. Um, so it would just be the amount that you pay for your electricity supply would now be fixed and you would see the name of whatever supplier was chosen through the CCA's bidding process but the mechanics of how you pay your bill etc all that would remain the same but my supplier is next amp isn't it not on a community solar um provider so with a community solar prescribed so uh, <laughs> with a community solar subscription, um, none of those electrons are actually going to your house, right? It's not that solar energy is not powering your home, right? You're getting a credit. So it's really, it's really something separate. Um, and so it doesn't affect your bill in, in, in like a tangible way. Um, in that regard, you're not switching your supply from community solar to CCA, 
Um, the community solar is kind of it's a separate thing um, because that solar is in another place and you're just getting credits so that the utility can say, hey, we're the ones getting that solar. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just something that's layered on. Um, and I would say it's more of a financial accounting mechanism than it is the electrons coming into your home, if that makes sense. It is confusing 100%. Um, and particularly in the situation that you're mentioning where you um, you are paying your bill back to Nexamp. In a lot of cases now at this point, um, you don't need to have two bills anymore. So we got to check on it in Central Hudson. But, you know, when I ran the CCA in Westchester, that local utility was Con Edison. And mm -hmm. when you signed up for Community Solar, you only got one bill from Con Edison. And it said you know, your, here's your CCA supplier, Jasmine Energy, nine cents, minus, you know, however many credits you got. Um, and then you'd have your delivery charge from Con Ed and it all came on one bill. So it is a little more confusing when it, when you have two bills, but joining a CCA doesn't affect your community solar discount. Okay, I'll just test to believe you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to take a look at your particular bill. Um, I'll drop my my email in the chat. And if anyone has, you know, very specific questions on their own circumstances, I'm definitely happy to take a look. Well, thank you so much for that. Of course. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so... <clears throat> Having both a CCA and a community solar, is this the really simple, <clears throat> as I am understanding this, the really simple way to look at it is the, the CCA gives me a price, which is is probably fair for the, with the market. It's probably not going to be much above the market. It might be below the market. That would be good. Uh, and if I'm also got community solar, that means I get 10% off whatever the rate is with cca correct and the, okay, just, the one caveat one caveat is that you don't just get 10 percent off of your cca supply rate community solar is 10 percent off of your whole bill so both the supply and the delivery that's one of the really unique and great things about it so you get that 10 percent discount on your whole bill i, I don't think i've gotten that so far but maybe Maybe it's coming. Sounds good. <laughs> see, definitely, you know, email me if, if anything looks weird on your bills, for sure. Um, Jasmine, me, we ran a... Alan, go ahead. Yeah, let me take the conversation in a different direction. Um, suppose you're a die-hard environmentalist and you want 100% of your electricity to come from renewable sources. Does joining the CCA guarantee that? Or I, I think there's two levels. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so when a municipality joins a CCA, they choose what they want the default electricity supply to be. Nine times out of 10 today, they choose 100% renewable energy. When I uh, ran a 27 municipality CCA, 24 of those municipalities were on 100% green energy. And so, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that what's coming through the wires to your specific home is always 100% green. What it means is that for all of the electricity used by CCA customers, an equal amount of renewable energy is put onto the New York State grid. And it's typically hydropower. Um, hydropower has the cheapest renewable energy certificates, um, and it's a really reliable form of renewable energy. And so typically that means for all of the energy used by CCAs, an equal amount of renewables is put onto the grid. That's if your town chooses renewable energy, 100% renewable energy as their default supply. Um, every CCA does need to also offer a standard supply. Um, of non-renewable sources in order to have, um, or I guess I'm not sure if they if we have to offer it, but every CCA does typically offer a standard supply, um, which is non-renewable. It's you know usually marginally cheaper than the renewable, and any individual customer can 
opt down to the standard supply, for example. So if the town of Olive says, hey, we're joining Mid-Hudson Energy Transition CCA, we're choosing 100% renewable energy, you're gonna get a letter in the mail that says, hey, you've joined Mid-Hudson Energy Transitions CCA, you've got 100% renewable energy for this many cents per kilowatt hour. If you don't wanna be in the program, sign and send this back or go online or give us a call. Or if you'd like to opt down to the standard supply, save a little bit of money, you know, you can do that as well. Um, so if you are on the 100% renewable rate and you are a diehard environmentalist, you know that um, there are renewable energy certificates covering your full electricity usage. If you want to have an even greater local impact, you can also sign up for community solar. Now you're supporting two forms of renewable energy. You've got the hydropower uh, for your electricity supply, and then you're supporting those local community solar projects as well. If you wanna go one better, if it's possible, if you, you know, own your own home and you've got a sunny roof, you can throw solar up on your own roof and that's the, the greatest benefit that you can have. Um, but your municipality chooses the default supply. So if the town of Olive said, we want to join a CCA, but we're going to choose the standard supply, similarly, any individual could go out and, um, and opt up to the renewable supply because CCAs offer both. But the default is chosen by the municipality. I hope I didn't make it more confusing by saying that. No, oh, thank you. Well, that was good. Jasmine, I have a question. Um... So at the Town of Olive, we've also run a bunch of seminars and one of the most popular was making my home energy efficient. Mm -hmm. And while you can get a 10% discount using community solar or working with community choice aggregation, people are really interested in how they can make their homes more energy efficient. A lot of times they can't afford this stuff. So can you talk about how, what you guys do to help people make their homes energy efficient? 100%. So we've got a few really exciting initiatives. Um, first and foremost, we have a grant funded pilot that we're going to launch hopefully within the next two months in Kingston, um, where we're going to bundle remediation and energy efficiency and pre-electrification services study it so that we can uh, come up with a standardized retrofit model and really simplify the process for folks. What we're hearing across the Mid-Hudson is that people really need project management support for this. I wouldn't say that it's what we wanted to do, but it's what people need. And so it's what we're going to do. Um, and so we're taking it upon ourselves to become a project management kind of entity for energy efficiency um, and electrification services. So what that means for us is having trusted contractors that we work with, trusted you know, energy auditors, and close relationships with NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Those are the folks that provide the, uh, most of the incentives. Um, also HCR is another uh, state agency. And so what we end up doing is really trying to braid all of the many resources that are out there because there are many um, and it is pretty difficult to navigate. And so uh, we're starting off with this pilot and then we're going to launch into a citywide program, starting with our existing CCA in Kingston, where we will be that project management entity. And folks can call us up and say, hey, I really want to make my home energy efficient. What can I do? And we're going to say, all right, well, we've got a great auditor. We're going to come out there. We're going to do a comprehensive audit. We're going to go beyond just the basic energy efficiency audit 101. We want to incorporate indoor air quality, solar potential, you know, look at mold and other remediation um, that really plagues the old building stock that we have out here. And then we can say, now you can go speak with the trusted energy advisors over at the Clean Energy Hub, or we can connect you with X, Y, and Z programs at NYSERDA so that you can get incentives to do the work that came out of your comprehensive assessment. And by the way, here are a few contractors that we vetted that we trust to do this work. Um, and so that's kind of... Uh, uh, how we see the energy efficiency, electrification, healthy, resilient homes program working. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. 
Yeah. I mean, ultimately, without a little bit of hand holding, a lot of this work isn't going to get done. Um, and so, as I said, it wasn't what we thought we were going to do, but it's what people asked for. And that's why I really say that for us, it's about listening to the community on what they want and designing programs that respond to community needs instead of us just saying, oh, yeah, everybody wants, you know, a, a car charger, right? And everyone's like, no, actually, we just want to lower our bills and we really need energy efficiency. Um, and so we're always trying to just make sure that we're designing programs that people actually want and need. Any other questions? I also, I see the chat's got a bunch. So I'll go through that and see if there's anything else. Um, I did see a question about, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I did see a question um, about where the hydropower is from. And in general, in, in New York state, if you wanna make a claim about purchasing renewable energy, it has to be um, tracked through a state energy system, which is called NIGATS, uh, New York Generation Attribute Tracking System. And so um, you are only allowed to purchase New York state energy if you wanna make that renewable claim. On a bulk basis, New York does import energy from elsewhere, including from Quebec, but you couldn't call that uh, renewable if that's the case. Yeah. Uh, Simon, could you just tell us a little bit about what the Champlain Express transmission line is that you wrote in the chat? Yeah, so that um, is a fairly controversial transmission line that's coming from Canada um part of it, it's going through lake champlain overland again to the hudson river and then down along the hudson river itself um, to new york city and it's supposed to bring large quantities of canadian hydropower to new york and remember also we're going to be getting all that offshore wind power coming into long island over the next several years as well so there's going to be a significant increase in power um, which, whether or not it's classified as renewable, is essentially coming from renew renewable resources. Um, part of that is to uh, replace the um, nuclear facility at, um, uh, that's been taken Indian off. Point. Indian, Indian Point. Indian Point. Because right now, all of the Indian Point has essentially been replaced by combined cycle gas generation. And so the idea of both the Champlain Express and the uh, offshore wind is to uh, bring uh, significant additional renewable resources. As uh, Jasmine said, the, the question will be obviously whether or not they're New York generated versus uh, brought in from outside. <laughs> yeah, and especially for the New York City grid, um, this is the state's plan to help New York City decarbonize. So obviously, New York City tons of people, not a lot of space, can't really build enough renewables to meet city demand. And so um, the state has approved two transmission lines. One of them is um, the uh, Champlain Express, as Simon mentioned, the other one is Clean Path New York. Um, and both of those are designed to wheel down more renewables to the city in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jasmine, could you just repeat your uh, email address? Yes, it is jasmine, J-A-S-M-I-N-E, at mid, M-I-D, dash, Hudson, H-U-D-S-O-N, dot energy. I Thank didn't you. choose the dot energy, so please don't fault me for it. <laughs> Everyone's like, you're not dot org. And I'm like, I'm sorry, it's dot energy. We tried to be cool. Uh, um, and yeah, I, I see um, a, a comment in the chat about Indian Point as well. And um, I know Cricket Valley was something that um, that came on with Indian Point, but I would say from our, you know, from our perspective, um, I, I ask a lot of people, you know, would you want a nuclear facility in your backyard? And most people say no, you know, so uh, for us, we've got a lot of proven renewable um, solutions that we, we want to stick by. And we know that, you know, we have 
wind and solar, and especially here in the Mid-Hudson, we have the space to build the renewables that we need. Um, and so we really want to get there. And one thing that I didn't mention that's really important to Mid-Hudson Energy Transition is our real desire for community-owned renewables. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at, and we're actually hoping to get a team of grad students on board to help us explore some kind of uh, new financial models for community-owned renewables. And so that's where our CCA really hopes to go. Um, we want community members to actually share in the wealth building opportunities and the ownership opportunities of the clean energy transition, going beyond just a 10% discount on your bill, as we've talked about, and actually, you know, cooperatively owning a local renewable energy project. So we have big ambitions, um, but we also have a lot of talented folks on our team and on our advisory boards. Um, and as I mentioned before, I ran the pilot for New York State um, rather successfully, I might add. Um, and so uh, we're, we're really excited to kind of usher in a new era of CCA and, and start that in the Mid-Hudson where there's, you know, big goals and um, a, a, a very robust, I would say, political climate for environmentalism. So we're lucky and we're grateful to be here. And I uh, definitely encourage folks to reach out. As I said, I will be going on vacation next week. So if you don't hear back from me right away, that's why. Um, but if you can catch me before Tuesday, um, then I'll give you an answer. Um. Can I ask one last question? Um, and this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, I am surprised that Central Hudson charges the same rate for electricity during the day as uh, same rate at night as it does during the day. And if you want people to electrify, if you want people to get electric cars, that seems to be not a great strategy. I understand you can get a cheaper rate during the night, but they raise the rate during the day, which seems to be counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that Central Hudson just being greedy or is there a reason? Because, you know, in lots of urban areas, they do charge less for electricity during the night. Yeah, I think it definitely varies utility to utility. It's hard to say their motivations without knowing what their hedging practices look like and how they're purchasing energy. I would say that um, time of use rates, as you're describing, are a really powerful tool to shift when people are using energy. Um, and when we look at the, the peak times, of the day that people use energy, it's really advantageous to shift energy, right? And so I think um, there, and I've seen in NYSEG territory in particular, uh, we used to see that the peak rate and the night rate were both well below market uh, to the point where we said, why would anyone not be on the time of use rate? I don't know if that's still the case, um, but I'd be happy to look into it. We did explore time of use rates uh, in the other CCA that I ran. Um, it was really hard to get good bids on the time of use rates is what we found. Um, but it's becoming ever more important. And when you have that bulk purchasing power, and then when you're uh, joining people together, right, and you can get a lot of people off of peak times, it becomes a, a real value add. Um, in general, I would say that energy efficiency and demand response, which is reducing your demand at particular times of day, is undervalued um, at the state and federal level. Energy efficiency is the greatest tool that we have, um, and there aren't enough financial benefits to, to shift your usage. Um, and so I would say we should really be looking at policy solutions. And, you know, maybe we all write a bill together uh, because it is really important that we are um, valuing that. Yes, megawatts <laughs> in the chat. Um, it, it's, it's, it's such an important piece of how we're going to, you know, actually <laughs> meet our energy goals. And as I said before, it's just not properly valued. So 
happy to look at, you know, your bill or any other examples that you have. Um, and then also uh, explore what our, you know, policy or regulatory options are there. Just to add to that, Jasmine, um, Alan Central Hudson last Friday introduced an EV time of day charging thing, which I just put the um, link in the chat. I was talking with them at their uh, open house and they said, oh, funny you're talking about this because tomorrow we're introducing a time of day oh. EV charging rate. Um, having said that, I know I looked at their time of use rate when they reintroduced it. They used to have a tempo program back in the late 80s and it was a very good deal. And then they got rid of it and then they reintroduced a time of use program. And I looked at it, compared it to my own charges and said it would cost me more to go with that time of use program than to go with a flat rate but hopefully at least for the evs this will make some difference i'll have to take a look at it yeah i put it in the chat for him thank you if there are no other questions i want to thank our um, speakers for a great talk um, this has been recorded and will go up on the third thursday environmental series YouTube channel so you can review it or share it with friends. And again, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having us. I had a great time. Very good job. Um, yeah, good. Uh, both, both speakers, you, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was great. Thank, thank you. you.